Today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 to 19, and I've titled it, in case there was any doubt, Jesus is who we need today. Last week, Doug left us with the question that Jesus asked his followers of himself, Who do you say that I am? And Jesus made bold claims about himself. He called himself living water, where we drink from and never thirst again. He called himself bread of life to satisfy the human soul and the only truth, the only way to come to the Father. He was called Son of God and Word, full of grace and truth. In the first week, the writer of Hebrews affirms that Jesus is the Son of God. And last week, we saw that he was the servant of all mankind, fully God and fully man, as stated in the Creed. Peter's answer in Mark 8, 27 to 29 was, You are the Christ, meaning Messiah. In Greek, it was Christ. In Hebrew, it was Messiah. In English, it means anointed one. The first hearers of this letter to the Hebrews knew this anointed one word well. The process of anointing marks the custom among the Hebrews of pouring oil over the head of a priest or king or judge and symbolizes the presence of God's Holy Spirit filling or shaping a person into a representative of God. Peter was acknowledging that Jesus was set apart from all others for something special. He either was all the things that he claimed to be, and what others have said about him, or, as others have argued, he was a liar or a lunatic. Well, table talk question, who has been a good representative of God in your life, and what made you think so? All right, the writer of Hebrews begins this next chapter with the acknowledgement of Jesus as apostle, which means sent one, and high priest. The gospel writers describe the three years of their seeing Jesus as human, being part of their everyday ordinary lives, consisting of family and friends, eating meals together, cooking fish for them, on the beach and working side by side. But if it's someone, according to the Hebrews, who is really set apart as God's representative, they would naturally think of Moses. He really was God's representative to lead the people out of bondage to freedom. Moses set the standard for living life as God would have people live. The idea of God coming to us as a human it's altogether different. When it comes right down to it, we might rather be like God than have God be like me. In view of the past two chapters then, with the description in mind of Jesus as fully God and fully man, let's read chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share... In the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, 
do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That's why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they've not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, and has, as has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Well, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This passage is speaking to the church or to those of us who worship God. It starts with this description of us as verse 1 says, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling and compares the human examples we have in particular the best with the best one they could think of Moses and it compares him with Christ and finds that Christ eclipses all examples the listener is exhorted to fix their thoughts on Christ because he is the perfect picture of faithful commitment to God and lived apart from any taint of sin. Fixing our thoughts is a call to faithfulness or being true, stuck on Christ. So here's some of the ideas, five different ideas of what faithfulness means. A healthy focus on Christ encourages us to faithfulness, to fix our thoughts on the one who is the supreme example of faithfulness. More than just assent to a creed, we are those who share in his calling. Second thought, faithfulness is a choice then, as well as a thought and a feeling. The Hebrew preacher addresses our head or our thoughts Describing Jesus as our high priest, he's the ultimate mediator between God and us and the perfect representative of God in our lives. This is doctrinally sound understanding of our relationship with God. But the writer also addresses our heart, calling us as part of God's household in verse 6 and companions or you know, workers together in verse 14, which focuses on building a much more intimate relationship with Jesus and not just a formal legal one. They say the choice needs to be timely and the time of opportunity is now, today. If you hear his voice, respond. Thirdly, two things can hinder this faithfulness. Sin and unbelief. This is characterized in example by those who fell in the desert. And Psalm 95, 7 to 11 is quoted. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today if you harden your hearts and all of that in a few minutes. Number four, by contrast, the faithful will persevere to the end. Stick with it. And number five, faithfulness is communal. We need each other's encouragement. We can't just, you know, wing it. Me and God, we got it. We, no, we need one another too. 
Now in our culture today, there are a couple of problems in the church that this patch passage starts to shed some light on. Today, more than ever, I see the church caught up in superstardom. We think that if there's a broad acceptance or fame from our Christian leaders or lots of hits on their YouTube channel, they must be really godly examples or representatives of God. But in fact, we need heroes, not superstars. And true heroes walk alone. Superstars will constantly look for a large consensus. But heroes will define themselves by the judgment of a future they see is their task to bring about, committed to that objective. Superstars seek success in building strong support, but heroes see success as the following through on their inner values. Though God, none go with me, Still I will follow Christ. Remember that old song? Some of you will. So when a famous person becomes a Christian, we think their acceptance of Christianity will give special validity to the kingdom of God or greatly advance its cause. But we need genuine heroes who give their lives in the trenches of daily sacrifice who will be held up as examples of faithful devotion to Christ no matter if anybody's noticing or not. The writer of Hebrews holds up two examples of faithfulness, Moses and Jesus. Heroes like Moses serve as tools used by God to magnify someone greater. Verse 2 to 5 tells us that God is building a house, that is his church. Moses was part of the house. But Jesus is the builder of the house. Jesus is the one who stands at the heart of the faith. There's another correction. In this chapter to a problem in the church, emphasizing grace and minimizing personal responsibility and accountability. You know, the beautiful thing about the Christian faith is that everybody is welcome, just as they are. Everybody gets in the same way by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save them. And therefore, everybody can meet the requirement of belief in Jesus. And often we remember praying a, such a prayer of salvation. God, come into my life and save me. And based on this prayer that was prayed one time, we may errantly believe, hey, me and God, we're good. I said the prayer, and we might even get baptized to really prove it all. But the writer of Hebrews here is saying, what is it that actually designates us as those who share in the heavenly calling? He describes us as his house, the people God is putting together. And these two qualifiers show up in verse 6 and verse 14. If, indeed, we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory, and we have come to share in Christ, if, indeed, we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. This is describing the quality of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ for which we need to take responsibility. We remember our prayer of salvation as the basis of faithfulness, not the basis of, of assurance. I prayed the prayer. Okay, so now I'm in. But, so now you're in. What do we need to do? How do we keep on being in in our relationship with God? Let's have a table talk again. How do we build a healthy relationship with Jesus. I read a quote this morning that may shed a little more light too. It's kind of convicting actually, but I thought it applies here quite well. It says, we are not owners of private lots in a gospel subdivision 
where the good news means anything we say it means on our own property. Instead, we are citizens of a divine commonwealth that depends heavily upon us to uphold its reputation. We have an obligation to one another. We have to think about how it is that we are to work together and how do I stay connected to Jesus in a healthy way, day by day by day. So to get a really clear answer to Jesus' question, who do you say I am, we need a clear and healthy view of Jesus and how he relates to us. We need intimacy with Christ that comes through prayer and obedience. Hurriedness is a barrier to building relationship. We're used to fast food and even fast relationships. I've heard of speed dating, but all of it's just going to give us indigestion at best. Trying to have relationship with Christ once in a while for an hour or two on Sunday will starve your spiritual soul. You will collapse without the inner spiritual and emotional resources to hold you up under external pressures. We will more readily choose obedience and faithfulness when we have cultivated daily a trust relationship with Jesus and have the encouragement of one another. We have seen that he hears and answers our prayer. I've been doing some reading on the issue of bonding in human relationships. How do we get connected to one another? And we build bonds with people when we know that they're available. <laughs> they'll pick up the phone. That they're responsive. They'll listen. And they accept our feelings. They don't try to change us. In the same way, we build a bond with Jesus when we know that he is indeed our high priest. He is available to us. Whenever we call, he is responsive and able to do something on our behalf. And he's accepting of us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us to our own devices. And he wants to heal our hurts. In this passage that we've read twice, we the church, are admonished not to harden our hearts. Hmm, that gives me pause. This is a big deal. In fact, the prophet Isaiah admonished hundreds of years before this. He said, Go tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes. They might hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Interesting that these verses are the only ones that are quoted or the idea repeated in all five of the first books of the New Testament. Matthew 13, 14 and 15, Mark 4, 12, Luke 8, 10, John 12, 40, and Acts 28, 26 and 27. God wants us to know that he really wants a relationship with us so he can heal us on the inside. But he will not take our responsibility away from us and what he finds in humanity instead is often Eyes closed, ears closed, la 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 la, not listening, hearts shut down. God cannot repent for us because that would violate our will and he won't do that. James says it this way in chapter 4 verse 8. He says, we can come close to God and God will come close to us. And he also urges us, to wash our hands, purify our hearts, because our loyalty is divided between God and the world. And he says, let there be tears for what we've done, sorrow and deep grief and sadness instead of laughter. And as we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up because he really wants to heal us. 
So as long as it is today, we are to continually ask God, what do I need to repent for today? God, help me. Where do I need to change today? What are you trying to say to me, Lord, that I've been too busy to slow down and hear? And also, who can I encourage today? We really need encouragement from one another. In some ways, this was a difficult week for me, and I really appreciated words of encouragement I received from others. Sometimes we all just need that. Don't quit. You're doing good. I see that it's not easy for you today, but God is with you. I'm praying for you. Don't give up. We need to hear that. In fact, the writer of, to the Hebrews says, we need it every day. As long as it is called today, uh, that would be every day. <laughs> so as we finish up today, if you're in a group, pray for one another and encourage one another another before you go and if you're by yourself today then for goodness sake pick up the phone and encourage somebody and um, you know pray for them and let's draw close to God he'll draw close to us God bless you friends